a mysterious extraterrestrial visitor fell into the Arabian desert in Yemen. It even scared away the camels of the locals as it swiftly approached, just as the locals were about to approach and investigate. The invasion began from that day onward. Meanwhile, in the state of Oklahoma, United States, Officer Tyson received a report of a missing truck. He went to the farm with his assistant Mary to investigate. As the farm owner suspected his nephews were involved, those troublemakers had committed previous crimes. But the farm owner contacted their workplace and learned that the two nephews didn't show up for work that day. Tyson disregarded the farm owner's speculation and walked to the back door. Looking out at the cornfield, a large flock of crows was circling above. So Tyson climbed to a higher place to observe. He saw a large pit burned in the middle of the field. So Tyson and Mary ventured into the cornfield to investigate. The pit was of considerable size, with a smooth surface. The missing truck of the farm owner was just ahead. The beverages inside the truck were still slightly cool, suggesting they had been opened for about half a day. At first glance, it seemed like the work of the farm owner's two nephews. Could they have crashed the truck while drunk, and then hid to avoid responsibility? Tyson expressed that it wasn't that simple. As those two kids didn't take the wallet, suddenly a swarm of locusts flew in from the front. After the locusts flew away, the two officers went to find a renowned local drug dealer to inquire about the whereabouts of the missing Carl and Griffin. Tyson asked everyone nearby, but no one knew the whereabouts of the two brothers. In fact, tonight was Tyson's retirement day, and he didn't have to investigate this case anymore. Yet, Tyson couldn't rest easy. He had been in this position for over 40 years, and had never encountered a case like this one. Tyson felt he couldn't give up on the disappearance of the two brothers. So he left the farewell party, and drove to the cornfield at the farm owner's house. Suddenly, eerie spikes emerged from underground and struck Tyson, causing him to fall. As he looked up at the sky, a shadow disappeared into the night. On the other side, at a press conference of the Tokyo Aerospace Agency in Japan, astronaut Mel was announcing the date for their journey to the space station. They would embark on a long-term space travel to study the effects of prolonged exposure to space on the human body. Before the rocket's departure, Martha from the communications department came in for final adjustments. Although she didn't interact much with Mel, they were close friends in private. This separation would be for a long time, and both of them felt deeply reluctant. Martha anxiously stared at the big screen, watching the rocket carrying her loved one ascend into the sky. Meanwhile, Mel saw her message from the space station. He had a happy smile on his face. Little did he know, a loud noise suddenly came from outside the capsule. Meanwhile, inside a primary school on Long Island, New York, the children suddenly started to have nosebleeds. Upon hearing the news, parent Anisha hurriedly rushed to the school, relieved to find that her daughter and son were unharmed. The teacher came over to explain the situation, and mentioned that Luke, Anisha's son, was the only one in the entire school who didn't have a nosebleed. The school suspected that asbestos or lead might be the cause, so personnel from the health department would soon come to investigate. During this time, parents were allowed to take their children away, so Anisha took her daughter to the hospital for an examination. The doctor didn't find any issues, so she took her children home. For some reason, Anisha couldn't reach her husband. Using a tracking app, she located her husband's car parked by the roadside, and that's when Anisha discovered her husband's infidelity. She ran back to the car, took her children, and returned home. Processing this reality on her own, Anisha found the woman's social media account based on the address of that house. The woman's name was Mandy, and she frequently posted recipes online. So, Anisha cooked a late-night meal based on the recipes. When her husband returned, she forced him to finish it. Her husband quickly realized that his affair had been exposed, and he was planning to confront the situation. The whole earth started to tremble. A scream came from their youngest daughter who was on the second floor. The couple hurriedly went upstairs to find their child. Anisha carried her daughter to the window, and saw scattered sparks of fire everywhere. Could it be that it was an earthquake just now? Anisha didn't want to be with her husband in one room, so she decided to go outside to calm herself down. Her husband stopped Anisha as it was too dangerous outside. If you don't want to see me, I can go out and find a place to stay, he said. Med pushed open the door, and saw that the street had turned into a scene of destruction. Every neighbor had a bewildered expression on their face, as no one knew what had happened. The neighbors looked at the wreckage, and suddenly asked Med, why is it that only your house didn't collapse? Upon realizing this, Med looked around in surprise, just as everyone else was bewildered. Suddenly, a scream came from from their youngest son Luke inside the house. He held his head and tried to block out the noise from the outside, but Anisha didn't hear any noise, and Luke gradually calmed down after screaming for a while. He said he heard a strange sound repeatedly shouting, Wajo. At that moment, the overhead lights came back on, 
and Med said he would make another emergency call. Anisha didn't pay much attention, but unexpectedly, the phone on the kitchen counter connected to the line from upstairs. She picked it up and listened, only to discover that her husband was talking to that woman, saying things like, I wish you were by my side. Anisha felt disgusted after hearing that, and later, Med came down to explain that he couldn't reach the authorities. Anisha ignored him, placed her son on the sofa, but in the next moment, the glass around them shattered. Anisha felt that she couldn't sit idly by, so she asked her two children to pack their things quickly, and prepare to go back to their hometown for shelter. The family of four got into the car, ready to depart, but at a critical moment, the car wouldn't start. Med angrily got out of the car and stopped a neighbor for help, but the neighbor explained that their car couldn't accommodate so many people. Med said, don't worry about Anisha and the children, just take me with you for a ride. The neighbor felt that the request was unreasonable and ignored Med, leaving the community. Anisha approached her husband in disbelief, and asked him why he had become like this. Anisha didn't expect her husband to answer, so she took his phone, reconnected the car's electronic lock, and finally managed to start the car. The boy Jack left the bus and headed to school. He met his crush Lisa in the hallway today. Jack's smile hadn't faded, yet when mischievous rich kid Monty bumped into him and knocked him over, Monty always deliberately bullies Jack. His friends quickly helped him up. Jack felt very sad because he was disgraced in front of Lisa. Later, the school organized an educational trip. Jack and Lisa sat in the same row across the aisle. Halfway through the journey, the bus lost signal, and the students' electronic devices started glitching. Lisa noticed that Jack had an old-fashioned music player, and sat next to him to borrow an earphone. Their friends gave them teasing looks. Jack looked out the window, and saw a procession of white sheep passing by. Suddenly, he felt a wave of discomfort, and he had a seizure of panic disorder unexpectedly. The bus compartment instantly became chaotic, and the teacher hadn't figured out what was happening. A few meteorites fell in front of the bus. The entire bus completely lost control, and headed towards a cliff. On the other side, in Tokyo, Japan, Martha was still unaware of the space station incident. Every day, she recorded video diaries, hoping that when Mel returned, they could share the moments of these 335 days. A few days later, she received news of the tragedy involving the Starlight vessel. Martha quickly returned to her workplace, and accessed the cameras, only to witness the aftermath of the explosion on the Starlight. Mel had died, taking a part of Martha with him forever. Martha felt like she had become a wandering spirit. Meanwhile, in the deserts of Afghanistan, Dick and his comrades were on a mission, riding in an armored vehicle. Unexpectedly, they lost contact with the command center, and quickly arrived at a residential area. However, they discovered that the streets were empty, and there was no sign of the previous team that had departed. After a while, local residents began to appear, and a masked woman told them, a strange entity attacked the first team that arrived not long ago, and they had retreated into a nearby school. Upon hearing this, Dick led everyone to search the school. The children huddled in a corner of the classroom. The wall next to them had a large hole from the explosion. A little boy with a nosebleed was dipping his finger in the blood, and drawing circles on the table. Dick also drew a smiley face on the table. He kindly asked the boy, have you seen any other American soldiers? The boy, upon hearing that, pointed towards the damaged wall hole. Dick looked outside through the gap, and saw a strange fog in the distance. Dick decided to take the team over to investigate. They found their missing comrades walkie-talkie on the way. They then sneaked into a nearby adobe house. Unexpectedly, the ground started shaking violently, and a cloud of yellow sand erupted into the sky. Dick couldn't see the whereabouts of his comrades, but when they broke through the sandstorm, they saw a massive red and black alien spacecraft hovering above. Dick ordered to open fire, but he soon realized that the bullets had no effect. Then Dick emerged from the sand, and discovered that all his comrades had vanished. Dick returned to the vicinity of the armored vehicle, but realized that all communications had been cut off. After tending to his wounds, he braved the scorching sun and continued on his way. He didn't go far before fainting to the ground. Dick didn't know how long he had been unconscious, until a local person slowly approached. The person threw a water bottle to Dick, but Dick had lost too much blood. After drinking the water and saying a few words, he fainted again. Fortunately, this local person was genuinely kind-hearted. He stayed by Dick's side and disinfected his wounds using traditional methods. The two of them chatted randomly despite the language barrier. They didn't care if the other person could understand, they just wanted someone to talk to. On the other side, Anissa drove halfway and found the street completely congested. The entire city plunged into darkness due to the traffic jam. They kept driving until the next noon, before finding a gas station. Anissa asked her husband to charge the car, while she took the children to the restroom. The TV at the rest area was reporting the disaster, and the news referred to it as an international terrorist attack. It wasn't just New York facing danger, the whole world was in crisis. 
Anissa looked at her husband through the window, and noticed that he was facing discrimination due to not being white, leading to an argument with the person at the charging station. Anissa saw the car keys on the table and grabbed them, calling out for Med to leave. The couple and their children got into someone else's car and drove away. In the evening, the family of four arrived in northern New York, and booked a hotel room to rest. Meanwhile, the situation in London was also not good. Jack and his classmates crawled out of the overturned bus, but they were trapped in a deep pit and couldn't escape. Lisa smashed the driver's window, and leaned halfway in to check on the teacher's situation. A metal rod pierced through his arm, rendering the teacher immobile. Monty was angry and had nowhere to let off, so he started taking it out on Jack. If it weren't for you suddenly falling ill, the teacher wouldn't have turned back, and the bus wouldn't have crashed into the pit. Jack didn't defend himself, and as night fell, the situation grew darker. Everyone tried to cover the vehicle to keep the teacher warm. Jack and Lisa lit newspapers, and branches so they could not only keep warm, but also signal to the outside. Monty came over and apologized to Jack when he saw the situation. He was feeling upset because of his father's affair, which is why he spoke so harshly. Jack comforted Monty, telling him not to be sad, and shared his own family situation. His father pushed his mother down the stairs, causing her to become disabled, and then abandoned his wife and child and left the place. Jack had never told anyone about these things before, but now he spoke about them just to console Monty. To Jack's surprise, Monty suddenly burst into laughter. It turned out that Monty's father hadn't actually had an affair, and he had intentionally made up the story to deceive Jack. Bruh, thank you for the story. Son of a wife beater. In the evening, Jack took off his coat and covered the teacher with it, then sat alone in a chair and started drawing. Lisa observed everything, and knew that Jack was a kind and passionate boy. Meanwhile, Monty quietly left the bus, and put out the campfire on the ground. Martha, who had been in a state of despair for a while, intended to find out the cause of the accident, but was unexpectedly stopped by her superiors. Martha snatched the other person's ID card, and ran into the control room. She reset the door lock password to block the guards, then, calling her trusted colleagues, she began examining the transmitted video files. Martha witnessed the scene when the explosion occurred. The starlight vessel seemed to have collided with something. Martha amplified the entire audio clip. She heard a faint voice saying, Wajo. The next moment, the superiors ordered someone to decipher the password and break in. Martha demanded a thorough investigation of the accident. It was evident that something had collided with the starlight vessel. However, the superiors stated that the satellites had not detected any comets or meteors. How could something collide with a spacecraft? Martha left the space agency with the audio recording. She found Mel's father who used to be an astronaut. The two of them listened carefully to the audio on the recorder. The old man increased the frequency of the noise. Martha was surprised to discover that the sand in the nearby potted plant had formed a pattern due to resonance. On the other side, London welcomed a refreshing morning. The teacher didn't survive the cold night, and the children were in disarray. Monty was causing chaos inside, making the situation even more chaotic. Jack stepped forward to stop Monty, but the latter blamed him, saying it was all his fault and calling him a coward, questioning how he could watch his father harm his mother. Jack was in a deep pain in his heart by hearing this. He walked to the edge of the cliff, and started climbing up with both hands and feet. Jack climbed higher and higher. Soon, he reached a breathtaking height. With victory in sight, everyone anxiously watched the only hope. Jack successfully climbed back onto the main road. His success inspired his fellow companions underground. Everyone rubbed their hands in anticipation, and followed suit in climbing. However, Jack was stunned by the scene in front of him. The plane ahead was covered in strange metal objects. These were the objects that had destroyed the bus. The metal had Russian writing on it. It looked like solar panels or components from a satellite. Jack stared at the Russian writing. Suddenly, he felt a wave of familiarity. He opened his doodle book. Sure enough, he found the exact same letters. Lisa, who was next to him, was very surprised. But Jack didn't offer any further explanation. Everyone prepared to walk back home. Monty forced everyone to stay in place. Jack approached to argue but was pushed back. But this time he didn't back down. I have three older brothers. Bigger than you. The meaning behind Monty's tricks was something Jack had long disregarded. If you want to stay, then stay, Jack said. After Jack finished speaking, he led everyone away. Meanwhile, Anisha's two children were huddled together discussing. Why is dad sleeping on the floor? They asked. At that moment, the little girl Sarah noticed that her brother had a black crystal in his bag. She was about to ask what it was when Luke interrupted sharply. The boy quickly put the crystal back into his backpack, and continued on the journey with their parents. Several soldiers with loudspeakers broadcasted that there had been a gas pipeline explosion. 
hospitals were closing, the federal government declared a state of emergency, and multiple counties received evacuation orders. The current situation is not optimistic. Med got off the car and asked a soldier for directions. Anisha took the opportunity to look through his phone, and found an ultrasound image of a fetus. She instinctively locked the car doors, but the children were still in the back seat. Anisha still allowed her husband to get back into the car. Halfway through, the young son started demanding to get out for a bathroom break. The couple stood by the roadside. They started arguing because of the illegitimate child issue. After they finished arguing, they realized that Luke was missing. The couple searched until late at night. Finally, they found Luke in a small cabin in the woods. An elderly couple took him in. The old man reminded the couple that there was a curfew in the area at night. You better leave in the morning, he advised. Meanwhile, in the Afghan desert, Dick was following the local to make his way. They had been circling around for two days. Finally, Dick's radio received a signal. Based on the location indicated, he barged into a hospital. He made his way down to the basement. On a tattered hospital bed, Dick saw his comrade's walkie-talkie. Yet, his comrade wasn't there. Instead, a female doctor suddenly appeared. She pointed to the bed in the adjacent room. His friend Chavez lay on it. Chavez was severely injured and barely hanging on. Dick wanted to take him away from there. The sound of the enemy troops could be heard from outside. He hid in the dark and opened fire towards the stairs. Then he pushed over a cabinet to block the corridor. Dick carried Chavez on his back and left through the back door. He hijacked a pickup truck and stuffed his friend inside. But Chavez had already stopped breathing. The pursuers were about to come and kill them. Dick quickly drove away to escape. He drove back to the military camp. To his surprise, the entire camp was empty. He couldn't find a single person. The radio couldn't establish contact with the command center. Dick searched through the camp. He found an emergency evacuation order. It required everyone to move to the Kabul Air Force Base. Dick dug a hole and buried his friend. His only wish now was to go home. On the other side, Anisha's family welcomed a new morning. The old man hoped that Med would accompany him to the store. Unexpectedly, the man was too afraid to go. Anisha, on the side, said, I'll go. She asked her husband to stay at home with the children. Then she drove to the nearby mall. To her surprise, it had been looted inside. At that moment, several soldiers barged in. They saw Anisha alone. They asked if she was injured, and if she needed a doctor. Anisha hurriedly explained, I am a doctor. She had come out this time to find food. The soldiers said that the convoy was going to the next town. There, they had ample food supplies, but they were in desperate need of volunteers with medical knowledge. Why don't you come with us? Anisha got on the car like that. In fact, she studied medicine for a few years at New York University. She gave up her dreams because of marriage. Now she was at the medical center in the refugee camp. She regained a sense of passion and belonging. Anisha approached a patient. She was about to assist the doctor in stitching the wound, but she suddenly noticed a strange mass in the patient's abdomen. Anisha used forceps to extract it. No one had seen such a strange thing before. The scene shifted to London. The children saw a truck by the roadside. The cargo compartment was filled with snacks and drinks. Everyone had a hearty meal. Jack approached the empty driver's seat. He noticed a black unidentified substance on the seat. Those small protrusions swayed with Jack's finger. Just then, the car's radio emitted a buzzing sound. Jack called his friend Alphonse over. He asked if he could use it to receive signals. Alphonse quickly tuned into the broadcast. He was about to change the channel, but the device emitted a piercing noise. Jack had signs of illness due to sound stimulation. Monty quickly grabbed the radio and smashed it. This action sparked strong dissatisfaction among the classmates. They asked Monty if he still wanted to go home. Jack sensed that something was off with him. He suspected that Monty had not lied before. His father had betrayed his mother. That's why Monty didn't want to go home. The night was approaching quickly. The question of staying or leaving caused a division among the children. Some wanted to stay by the car and wait for rescue. At least there was a car compartment for shelter here. And there was ample food and water. Meanwhile, Jack, Lisa, Monty, and others, chose to continue searching for a place to stay. Meanwhile, Marsha returned to the Japanese Aerospace Agency. She used the ID card left by Mel to open the door. Then she played the audio for her supervisor to listen to. Since the human ear could hear Weijo, it meant that there was no decompression in the starlight vessel. There was still air inside. Mel and the others might still be alive. The supervisor suddenly wore a mysterious expression. He said, you're not the only one who can hear this sound. About six hours ago, the Hope Experimental Module also sent an audio clip. At least six Event Horizon telescopes have collected this interferometric measurement data. Its origin and form fundamentally belong to extraterrestrial. So these audio recordings are actually the language of aliens. The supervisor told Marsha that someone from the United States had already arrived. This matter will be announced soon. Marsha hoped that the aerospace agency would lend her a set of equipment to establish communication with the antenna. The supervisor said, I don't have the authority, but you can break in and steal it. After saying that, 
he handed the access card to Marsha, the latter took the desired equipment and left. On the other side, Dick finally contacted his family, he was talking to his wife at the moment. Suddenly, she said, the president has started a live broadcast. Dick immediately silenced himself, and listened closely to the voice on the phone. At this moment, people all over the world, were paying attention to this global live broadcast. The words of the US president were translated into 100 languages, and played on electronic devices. She stated that various events seemingly unrelated are taking place around the world, but now I want to tell everyone, they are not completely unrelated. All the evidence points to the sky, towards the stars and the unknown distance place. Regardless of whether we are prepared or not, alien visitors have already invaded. Now, regardless of nationality, faction, religion, or race, we all belong to the same race. Human, please extend your hand to help. Together, let's defend our only home. Anisha followed the medical team's vehicle. She heard that the school ahead had been attacked by unidentified creatures. Upon hearing about the school, Anisha remembered that she couldn't leave. She had to go back to protect her two children. Anisha asked the driver to stop the car and then jumped out, running back on foot. On the way, she saw the gruesome corpses, and a wave of unease washed over her. Anisha tried to start a car parked by the road, but found that it wouldn't start. She had to give up the means of transportation, and picked up a gun from one of the corpses to continue her journey. Anisha walked until midnight before returning to the cabin, but there was no sound inside the house. She jumped through the window, and called out her children's names loudly, but the room remained silent. The kettle hummed on the stove, indicating that someone had been there not long ago. Anisha continued searching for everyone, but she stumbled over a corpse on the ground. Shortly after, strange sounds came from outside. Anisha was so scared that she ran up to the second floor in one breath. She locked herself in the storeroom, and due to the house shaking, the containers on both sides kept spilling out various items. At that moment, the small door of the attic suddenly opened, and the old homeowner reached out a hand, pulling Anisha into the attic. Med and the two children were sitting in the corner, while strange noises occasionally came from downstairs, and the mental state of the female homeowner was on the verge of collapse. She asked Anisha to take the children and leave, but the male homeowner believed that it would make noise, and attract things from outside. Anisha felt that staying there any longer was not a solution, and both sides refused to give in, pushing each other in the attic. The daughter, Sarah, was pushed downstairs, and Anisha signaled for her not to make any noise, but the next second, Sarah began to cry and scream, so Anisha had no choice but to kick the hole wider, and jump down as well. At that moment, Sarah was still crying loudly, and Anisha covered her mouth. She hid behind the door, holding her daughter, as the extraterrestrial creatures passed by quietly outside. Anisha saw a dark figure on the wall, and was so scared that she didn't dare to breathe loudly. The commotion outside grew louder, and Sarah opened her mouth to cry out again, but Anisha quickly covered her mouth. The female homeowner, frightened, kept retreating but accidentally stepped into a gap, and half of her body fell off. The male homeowner tried to pull his wife up, but her lower body was grabbed by the creature, and the woman let out a scream. Anisha took the opportunity to take Sarah, and hide in the basement. Med also took his son downstairs. He wanted to leave the cabin in one go, but Anisha felt it was too dangerous. Luke chose to rush into his mother's arms, and Med didn't give up on his idea. He carefully moved the cabinet in front of the door, and Anisha, looking through the mirror on the wall, noticed that the extraterrestrial creatures were approaching. She tried to alert Med, but he was too focused to hear. The next second, Med was tackled by the extraterrestrial creature, and Anisha quickly picked up the handgun from the ground. She ran with her child towards the back window, and they successfully broke the glass and crawled out of the room. Anisha rushed to the front of the car, but found that the door wouldn't open, and it was then that the male homeowner ran out. He reached into his pocket and threw the car keys over, and Anisha grabbed the keys and started the car, but she didn't allow Luke to open the door randomly, and the next second, the extraterrestrial creature rushed out, and tackled the male homeowner. Anisha instinctively drove away, but accidentally crashed into an obstacle, and the car got stuck in place. The heavy rain blurred her vision. Anisha dared not move recklessly, but suddenly the creature rushed over, smashing through the windshield, desperately trying to get inside. Anisha raised the handgun and fired, till she ran out of bullets, so she grabbed something from the car and threw it. The creature, with its mouth wide open, refused to retreat. At this critical moment, Anisha grabbed the crystal from her son's bag, and stabbed it with force. Black blood sprayed from the creature's body, and Anisha didn't dare to stop. She kept stabbing the creature until it stopped moving. Then Anisha opened the car door and pushed it down. At that moment, Med stumbled out of the cabin, and Anisha helped him into the car before driving away. Anisha asked Luke where the crystal came from, and Luke explained that he just picked it up casually. As soon as the words were spoken, Med became motionless. Anisha immediately stopped the car, and checked her husband's condition, realizing that he had a pneumothorax. 
Anisha sterilized the scissors, and inserted them into Med's body to release the air, and after professional first aid, he finally regained consciousness, the family arrived at a restaurant by the street. It says Paul. Anisha opened the power switch, and cooked using the ingredients in the restaurant. Med re-evaluated his wife, who was also known as a stunt driver, a surgeon, and a fried cook. He never knew Anisha had so many skills. The sudden disaster brought the family closer together, and obedient Luke took the initiative to pray before meals. I'm thankful that Dad's okay. That Mom saved us. After filling their stomachs, they went to the shelter. Surprisingly, Anisha met the doctor she had encountered before. He stayed behind to further examine the injured Med, while Anisha took the children to rest. The leader knew she was a doctor, and specially arranged a single room for the three of them. Luke felt guilty because he knew, his mother gave up her medical career after conceiving him. On the other side in the desert, Dick drove forward and came across a scene of fire. The bodies on the ground had been charred, and ashes were falling from the sky like snowflakes. Not far away, there was also an extraterrestrial corpse. Immediately after, someone flashed ahead, and Dick quickly followed with his gun to investigate. There stood a family of four, and Dick asked them to lift their shirts, ensuring they had no weapons. He approached with his gun raised. Fortunately, the leader of the group could speak English. He had just come from the Travis base ahead, where thousands of coalition forces had all died, and the planes had turned to ashes. Dick was extremely disappointed when he heard this, because he was originally planning to go to Travis base for help. David took out some rations to share with Dick, and said that their family was planning to go to Kabul to find a plane, because without a car, it would require walking for over 300 kilometers. Upon hearing this, Dick glanced at his car, and decided to take them to Kabul together. The two children in the back seat were sound asleep, having grown up in a chaotic country where they had become accustomed to invasions. Whether it was aliens or the US military, it made no difference to them. After a long journey, they arrived at Kabul airport, and managed to catch a plane that was about to take off. The airport staff allowed Dick, who was holding a gun, to board but stopped David, who was accompanied by his family. Quick thinking, Dick traded his Navy M4 rifle to secure the family's boarding opportunity. The cabin door closed slowly, isolating the desperate crowd. Meanwhile, in London, UK, Jack and his group arrived at a nearby village. They discovered that there was not a single figure in sight. The village's power supply had also been cut off. Just when they were feeling desperate, a car suddenly passed by. The four of them immediately rushed over, and waved a signal for help. The woman in the car was feeling down, as her entire family had been killed by aliens. Jack and the others were unaware of the situation in London and pleaded with the woman to give them a ride. Unable to refuse the children, she ended up giving them a ride back into the city. The wide street was deserted, and thick smoke billowed from the surrounding high-rise buildings. The four of them decided to go back to their respective homes first, and Lisa accompanied Jack. She still remembered the Russian phrases from her notebook, so she asked Jack what he knew, but Jack couldn't articulate it either. He felt like his brain could sense something. Just then, strange sounds came from not far away. The two of them quickly hid behind a wall, and Jack cautiously peeked out to observe. After the peculiar-looking extraterrestrial creatures left, he led Lisa out from their hiding spot. The two of them hastened their steps back home. Mel's father stopped in front of a certain base with Martha and Adam. Martha informed the security, I'm the chief expert of space and surveillance systems. Upon hearing this, the security guard opened the gate, leaving Adam baffled. When did you become an expert? Adam asked with a puzzled expression. Martha had used her superior's email to issue commands, demanding all command authority to be transferred to herself. Then Martha severed the communication between the organization and headquarters, ensuring her fabricated identity wouldn't be exposed for the time being. Martha, without feeling guilty for her deception, took control as soon as she entered the base. She instructed the staff to convert the sound in the audio into a spectrum, and then used a radio telescope to search for that signal. Martha wanted to locate the source of the audio, and send a reply message to them. The staff played the collected frequencies, and the sound patterns echoed like numerous radios playing simultaneously. Martha couldn't help but suspect that it might not be a broadcast message, but rather a hive network. They needed to find a specific individual sound within it, so Martha ordered the use of signal filtering to exclude all other patterns recognized by the machine learning network. They worked tirelessly until late at night, and finally found a set of suspected signals. However, before Martha could enter the account verification, she was dragged away by the people from headquarters. Before long, the boss arrived at the scene, and they found the coordinates of the Starlight vessel, realizing that it was held captive by extraterrestrials in Earth's synchronous orbit. They needed access to the Starlight vessel, as it was the only opportunity for the Aviation Bureau to establish contact with the extraterrestrials. Yet, the communication system was designed by Martha, so she returned to her position. 
She quickly activated the communication system of the Starlight vessel. The American side hoped to establish contact with the extraterrestrials, and convince them to leave Earth. However, before that, linguists needed to identify the shared semantics between humans, and the extraterrestrial language, as without it, there would be no possibility of communication between the two parties. Martha attempted to convert and upload Mel's videos, and photos in a different format, hoping to catch the attention of them. Unexpectedly, the base indeed received a faint signal. On the other hand, although Dick boarded a plane, he was intercepted by the British before reaching the United States. Due to the urgent situation, they needed to requisition the aircraft, leaving Dick stranded in the UK. He climbed to a high point, overlooking the entire city. He saw a scene of post-apocalyptic desolation, but luckily Dick found a usable phone booth, and finally managed to contact his wife. The couple seemed to have experienced some unpleasant events, and were going through a difficult period. However, Dick realized one thing, he deeply loved his wife and couldn't be without her. Meanwhile, not far away in the city of London, Jack returned home to find his mother had already passed away, covered in black extraterrestrial substance that extended all the way to the ventilation shaft. Jack didn't have the courage to touch his mother's hand, he had lost the person he loved the most, and couldn't let Lisa fall into the same situation. Jack opened a drawer, and took out a painting from, before the disaster occurred, he had actually foreseen the danger long ago. Every time he had an epileptic seizure, Jack could sense them. The two of them planned to go to the hospital to find Lisa's mother, and figure out Jack's situation. Unfortunately, as soon as they left the apartment building, they encountered extraterrestrial beings ahead. Lisa pulled Jack into a nearby pub to hide, and there they saw Dick. Seeing Dick dressed in military attire, Lisa asked him to take them to the hospital. Dick wanted to ignore the two children. Lisa took out Jack's sketchbook, and Dick casually flipped through a few pages, only to unexpectedly find his own shoulder patch on one of the drawings. During Jack's epileptic seizure a few days ago, he saw some stranded soldiers. Upon hearing this, Dick agreed to escort the two of them to the hospital. The base doctor strongly wanted Anisha to stay. She asked her son to go find Med first while, she stayed behind to have a conversation with the doctor. Little did Anisha know that Luke encountered a chubby boy on the way who wanted to show him something. Anisha was unaware that her son didn't go to find his father, so she followed the doctor to inspect the base's supplies. There is a shortage of medication here, with only antiseptics and adhesive bandages available. They need people who can adapt to unpredictable situations. Upon hearing this, Anisha asked the doctor in response, We have only met twice. How do you know that I am capable of being a doctor? I know you're good with your hands. I know you're a good mom. The atmosphere gradually became ambiguous. The two of them forgot about their situation, and became passionate. Meanwhile, Luke was taken by the chubby boy into the morgue, where the body of a person killed by extraterrestrials lay on the operating table, covered in a layer of black substance on the surface of the skin. When Anisha came to her senses, she realized that Luke was missing. She frantically searched for her son and ended up in the morgue, where she saw a group of people. Luke was using a crystal to remove the unidentified substance from the bodies. Upon learning about this situation, the people at the base immediately conducted experiments on the samples using the crystal, and were surprised to discover that it could indeed kill extraterrestrial creatures. The people at the base requested to transfer Anisha's family to the Pentagon, as they held the opportunity to eliminate the extraterrestrials. However, during the journey, a group of unknown armed individuals suddenly opened fire, causing the vehicle carrying Anisha to be disabled. The soldiers took cover behind the vehicle, and started to fight back, while Anisha took her family, and the crystal and ran into the woods. Anisha slipped and fell down a slope, and when the unidentified extraterrestrial tissue came into contact with the crystal, it retreated like a tide. Meanwhile, Mel was floating in space, and heard the sound emitted by the starlight vessel. Mel wanted to respond, but she realized she couldn't make a sound. All she could manage to say with her mouth was, Weijo. Upon hearing this, the US side, believed that the other end of the signal was likely an enemy, and they wanted to bomb the coordinates with nuclear weapons. Marsha only had 78 minutes. If she couldn't convince the enemy to evacuate within this time limit, the US would activate nuclear defense. Linguists carefully examined the received audio, and found that it lacked fricative sounds and spaces for inhalation. Although it was Mel's voice, she didn't breathe while speaking. Could it be that an alien was impersonating Mel? Marsha said she had a way to verify. She returned to the communication channel, and asked Mel if she remembered what they talked about the first time they met at Marsha's house. The next moment, David Bowie's song came through the speakers. He was the favorite singer of both Mel and Marsha, and they always had conversations about him when they first met. But the US side quickly cut off communication. Now, whether Mel was alive or not didn't matter anymore. What they needed to do was to save the lives of billions of people. Marsha's intention was to save Mel, but the result was that she directed the nuclear bomb towards Mel. On the other side, 
Dick and the others arrived at the hospital, they didn't find Lisa's mother, but they found a neurologist, Jack hoped she could induce him epileptic seizure, and although the doctor initially refused to cooperate, with Dick threatening her nearby, she complied with Jack's command, guided by the flickering light, Jack quickly entered a seizure state, countless incomprehensible images flashed through his mind, with billions of neurons moving in perfect synchronization, this was something the human brain couldn't possibly achieve, and the doctor had never seen such a situation before, Jack kept murmuring to himself, repeatedly mentioning Wei Zhou, the sun, and Marsha, Dick had a terrifying suspicion that Jack could see what the aliens saw, at that moment, the extraterrestrials were approaching the hospital, and Jack could sense that they were right downstairs, Lisa didn't find her mother, so she ran back to join the two of them, Dick protected the two children while searching for an escape route, they saw the menacing extraterrestrial creatures through frosted glass, for some reason, Jack felt they were coming for him, and sure enough, the next moment, the creature broke through the door, its full form revealed before Jack, and as Dick pushed the two children into the room, he held his gun at the door, but the bullets had no effect, Dick immediately grabbed the nearby gas canister and, in conjunction with the handgun, sprayed a large flame, successfully burning the creature to death, however, before Dick could catch his breath, another extraterrestrial creature appeared, it crawled into the ventilation duct, and headed towards the room where Jack, and the others were hiding, Dick called them out, but the monsters seemed to have targeted Jack, no matter which direction the three of them ran, the creatures relentlessly closed in on Jack, Dick quickly ran out of bullets, so he pulled out a knife to protect the two in front of him, Jack felt a splitting headache as if the monsters were residing in his mind, Jack commanded them to stop, and unexpectedly, the creatures froze in place, Dick didn't have time to ponder this, and immediately carried Jack out of the hospital, but the boy fell into a coma, the next moment, a massive explosion resounded in the air as the nuclear bomb, successfully hit the alien spacecraft holding Mel, humans have defeated the alien invaders, this news quickly spread all over the world, Jack has been unconscious since he fainted, although his vital signs are stable, doctors cannot detect any brainwave activity, Jack's brain cells have all died, Dick doesn't have the courage to stay in the hospital any longer, because he and his wife have a chronically ill son, they have spent countless nights and days staying by their son's bedside in the hospital, but in the end, Dick still witnessed, the doctors removing the devices from his son's body, the young life passed away before his eyes, Dick cannot go through this pain again, he asked Lisa to go find their mother, it's time for him to return to the United States, upon hearing this, Lisa gave the sketchbook to Dick, hoping that he would remember that Jack saved us, Dick walked towards the street like a wandering soul, people were cheering and celebrating the victory of the war, he entered a telephone booth to seek help from the consulate, finally, he managed to book a flight back to the United States, however, before returning, Dick needs to fill out some forms, through his conversation with the official, we learned that, all the alien creatures and spaceships, were all killed at the moment the nuclear bomb detonated, tests indicate that they are all identical, each one has undergone genetic coding, the purpose of the aliens staying on earth, is to transform this place, the black substance they see Crete, will release gases into the atmosphere and alter the air, after completing the necessary procedures, Dick finally boarded the plane back to the United States, he has been away from home for two years, Dick took out the key hidden under the porch, and entered his own home, this time, he promised his wife that he would leave the military, and be with his family forever, on the other hand, Anisha went to find Med, unfortunately, she only saw bullet holes with blood on the trees, she returned to her original location to reunite with the children, Luke observed his mother's expression, and guessed that his father had already perished, Anisha took the children and sought refuge in a house in the forest, although the news of the alien's defeat had spread, she still felt that things were not that simple, Luke resented his mother for leaving his father behind and departing, the united family, had new rifts between them, Anisha and the children used toys and drawings, to create a makeshift tomb for Med, Luke threw away that strange crystal, he looked up at the sky, surprisingly, he saw green auroras, at the same time, a military aircraft, arrived in the Amazon rainforest in Brazil, the alien spaceship that was shot down by a nuclear bomb is parked here, meanwhile, Martha accidentally entered a temple for cultivation, she received a set of abnormal signals in her mailbox, Luke in New York suddenly had a change of heart, he found that crystal again, he discovered a pattern resembling water ripples on it, inside the morgue of a London hospital, Jack, who had been declared brain dead, suddenly opened his eyes, he woke up in a void of consciousness, first, he heard his parents arguing, then he saw Mel's father, the old man gave Jack a gift, inside the red box was a compass, <laughs> At this moment, outside Jack's realm of consciousness, a massive alien spaceship slowly appeared, it turns out the disaster has just begun, the story of the first season ends here, in fact, until the last episode, the entire storyline has just begun, 
This series is not a sci-fi blockbuster about fighting aliens. Instead, it starts from four storylines. It tells the story of an alien invasion, impacted on four completely different groups of characters. Before the arrival of the aliens, their lives were already falling apart. The apocalypse, on the contrary, changed the way each character views toward the world, forcing them to grow emotionally at a rapid pace. So, audiences expecting a monster-fighting spectacle might feel quite disappointed. The story's pace is indeed slow, and the focus is scattered. Yet, as the second season's storylines start to wrap up, perhaps there will be some changes.